This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome to the Linux Action Show Season 19, Episode 5, recorded and released on November 10th, 2011. From a very fall-stricken Pacific Northwest, my name is Chris. And my name is Alan. Hey there, Alan. we got a big show today, don't we? We do, yeah. This episode is exciting. So uh, this week we've rolled out um, a new live stream thanks to Alan's uh, ScaleEngine.com company. Yep. And uh, it's powering all kinds of different streams right now. So we went from just having the live stream in a Flash player to now you can actually bust it out on your mobile device or into VLC, which is sweet. Yes, and, so, uh, so uh, just under the stream on the live page, jblive.tv, there's a link on the left, uh, which is a VLC playlist in the XSPF format, and that's an XML playlist, and if you open that in VLC, it automatically opens the stream and sets all the required settings. Yeah, yeah. Chatham um, tells me that I said it was November 10th, it's November 13th, my apologies yeah, so, for that. Um, the center link is the raw RTSP, that'll work on your cell phone and so on. You yeah. can use that in VLC, but if you do, you want to, or M player or whatever player, if you use the RTSP link, you want to make sure you set the caching to at least yeah. 2,000 milliseconds. Otherwise, you'll get some stuttering. Here's a little, uh, if you're looking at the live stream uh, here, uh, or the video version, there's now just under the player, there's these little links. And these are really yep. cool. It, it's really kind of turning, transforming the network into a full-time TV station because now you don't need Flash to watch us live. You don't need anything, which is awesome. As Adobe's yep. abandoning Flash for the mobile devices, the Linux Action Show is too. And I just, it, it's, I couldn't be more yep. excited. And uh, there's wanna, a, also a link for iPhone and iPad. Yes, yep. Uh, and it works on uh, um, uh, and I tried on the iPad and it, works, it yep. works pretty and well because you can, you know, it just, it's an HTML5, so. Yeah, and there's, uh, it also works in like Safari browser on Mac as well. Oh, okay. Uh, now, uh, I should probably tell people what we're talking about today. It's Fedora 16 yes. Day. We're going to review Fedora 16 and that'll yep. be in the second half of the segment. We're also going to bring on a community member uh, who, who I believe, Alan, do you recall his does Randall run Red Hat servers for Coca-Cola or something like yes. that? Yes, yeah, yeah, he's a uh, Linux admin for Coca-Cola. Yeah, so we're going to bring him on because they're a Red Hat shop and he's a Fedora user. So he's going to join us to chat about Fedora 16 in the second half of the show. In the first half of the show, we're going to give you our Linux desktop app pick, also an Android pick I think most of you aren't going to be able to live without, and as well as a lot of news. We've got some great news this week, and I'm going to geek out a little bit about Linux Mint 12 in a few. But cool. uh, before we get to all of that, we should say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com. Mm -hmm. GoDaddy.com, of course, of course, the world's number one domain name registrar. And uh, I love doing like the, uh, I was trying to come up with some maybe clever names for, mm -hmm. the, uh, for the JB live stream. And I just love going over here and playing with the different options. They, yeah, they, the, they make some decent recommendations too. They do. Yeah. And they can, you can search like all kinds of domains. And what the what nice thing is, is if you use our code Linux, you're going to save 10% on checkout. And if you want to get some shared hosting, use the code Linux20, and you'll get 20% off of hosting. And really, their hosting plan's pretty great, pretty cheap already. So you take 20% oh, yeah. off that. That's not bad. GoDaddy has oh. uh, is, is been, is been a huge sponsor of the network. They're now also sponsoring our TechSnap show. So yes. it's, we're just incredibly, incredibly, incredibly glad to have GoDaddy on board. They've helped me go full-time. So, yeah. uh, and, well, and the other thing is always nice to have a sponsor for a company you actually use. Yeah. And it like, runs Linux. We'd be using, yeah. We, we'd be using GoDaddy even if they didn't yeah. sponsor us. Right. So it's really cool that yeah. they sponsor us. So if you want to help support the show and make more Linux action show goodness hit the world, go over there and use our code Linux when you check out. And thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode. Love mm -hmm. those guys. All right. So uh, let me give you my, uh, my runs Linux this week. This one's a fun one. And I'm actually going to give you two because. There's I two. do this, Alan. <laughs> well, the, the second one I'm going to give is actually one that I called like a year ago, and I already, already said it runs Linux, but now it's actually like usable, so I want to just give people an update. But the first cool. one came from the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit and uh, from uh, user Jason John Wells, and he says, The Global Village Construction Set, which is a modular, do-it-yourself, low-cost, high-performance platform that allows the easy fabrication of the 50 different industrial machines that it takes to build a small, sustainable civilization with modern comforts, runs hmm. Linux. That's awesome. Yeah, and you can supply it with like blend, uh, Blender files and all, actually all kinds of different CAD tools. And uh, it uses, uh, it has amazing potential. The one that jo Jason John Wells goes on to say, you can use it with open source 3D printers and it's got serious financial backing and it's been featured on TED. 
So this thing's like really going to, it's like this yeah. Linux powered device that lets you create all the tools to set up a sustainable community. Pretty wild. Um, another thing that my other runs Linux is also pretty out there. And if you recall from a while ago, I mentioned the, the, uh, the new uh, Nikola Tesla S, their sedan, all electric car. Their 2012 model will run Linux. And specifically, the cool part that's going to run Linux is their awesome, awesome dashboard system. It's right. got uh, all the controls for temperature and Pandora and the, and the speedometer built into this touchable flat screen that runs on top of Linux. That's awesome. Yeah, it is really awesome. And it looks like, it actually looks like a paradise for a passenger, but you can also pull up on this Linux dashboard like uh, engine statistics, like your, uh, your overall power usage stats and uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the energy you're recouping by braking. You can also do things like uh, browse your music library, and then it shows the corresponding album art on the dashboard. So you just look down at your speedometer, you can see the album art. And, and of course, awesome. you can do things like temperature control and, and nav and whatnot. So I've already done this one once before, but that is such an awesome runs Linux. The Nikola Tesla 2012 sedan model. Come on, how cool is that? So I, I had to mention that it is, again. Yeah. And now that people are actually getting their hands on it, it's, it's getting out there in the first uh, test You know, drives. it's a little... Uh, <laughs> I, I love the idea of being able to see all these like graphs and charts of what's going on in your engine, but... Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it's like, you're supposed to be driving. Yeah, yeah. No, that's all for the passenger, I say. Let, let the uh, navigator focus on that stuff. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the Android app pick, and then we'll get to our Linux pick. We like to just bust through these at the top of the show, because we've got a ton of show for you guys today. We do. And this pick is <coughs> maybe one of the most beautiful Android apps I've ever used. It's called uh -huh. Any.do, and it's a simple to-do manager. It's free in the Android marketplace, and it's gorgeous. It might, it might, you, might, you might say it has a little Windows 7 styling to it, a little Windows Phone 7. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the flat text and the uh, and like the uh, you know just very basic kind of UI, but the simplicity is where the beauty is, and it is it's got these smooth, slick transitions. It also the other really nice feature is it supports voice commands, so you can just dictate to it, sort of a la Siri, and it also supports sharing and collaboration to do. So you can just within your okay. to do manager, you can just automatically share with other folks. Uh, it is it is I can't really show it to you because it's so white, but it is so gorgeous. And it also syncs up with Google, so you can have uh, all the oh. stuff that you enter in here automatically sync to your Google account, which shows up in your Gmail to-dos and, and all kinds of things. And uh, just using this thing is so That's smooth. That's the feature right there that'll set it for me, because my Google is then synced into my Thunderbird email. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I have it synced to Evolution. And right. so I can type, it's, it's, it's awesome. So it enters things into Evolution, which syncs to Google. That then syncs to this. This also supports local backups. So like if you do a to-do list and you screw it up, you can you know, go in there and remove it. <laughs> it nice. also, once you're, all, once you're done with tasks, you can go in here and just shake the thing and it'll clear all the completed tasks off your screen. So uh, that's any.do. Nice. And it, like I said, honestly, one of the most, and it also has a dark theme, one of the most beautiful Android apps I've ever used. It's got a great rating too in the, in the Android marketplace. So I think you guys will really, really like this app. I've really liked it. And it's sometimes hard to keep track of all the various things you have to do. Now this one, I think what it's really missing is it is reliant on Google. So I'll make a pick soon for those of you who want to use desktop applications to sync with and not so much the Google Cloud. I'll, I'll have that in a bit. But if you're a Google user, go but check yeah, out I'm, it. I kind of adopted the, the Google thing because even with my old Windows phone, is my calendar and everything would sync to Google through a fake um, exchange server. Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. honestly, it was the only way to get the stuff from my phone into Thunderbird easily. Yeah, true. Now, my next pick, you know, with the universal pick, we generally make a Linux desktop app pick, but every now and then, I like to pick a web service that's also beneficial to Linux and Unix desktop users in general. Right. And th this week, this one came from the Reddit. So uh, uh, thank you very much. I have a, a credit to the person in the show notes. I, I'm blanking on the name right now. I apologize. But... Uh, this is Keep Vid, and what you do is you put the URL to say like a YouTube video or Daily Motion, and here you know what I'll try it. So okay, um, if I go over to uh, YouTube.com, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things you might you might have recalled about YouTube is they actually they actually transcode like everything you upload to a bunch of different formats, yep, um, including they're WebM. experimenting with WebM right now, yeah. yeah. And so uh, you can, if you go to their test tube thing, you can actually subscribe where any yeah. video that is in WebM will be yep. displayed in WebM instead yep. of Flash. Right. Which is kind of cool. I mean, that is, yeah. that is pretty cool. As long I, as you have a modern browser, it works yeah. quite well. So I'll take, uh, so I'll take this uh, link here of TechSnap, right? Here's us uh, doing TechSnap, which was a, a great episode if you haven't seen episode 31. And then you paste it into the KeepVid box. And uh, you don't need all this extra junk on the end of it. 
And then when you hit that, it goes and analyzes the file, and it's, it loads a little Java applet, so you have to say, yeah, allow the Java applet if you, if you haven't done that before. Once it's done, though, it'll come back with all the various formats that the, uh, geez, Java on the Mac is so slow, uh, okay. that are available for download, including WebM, do 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 and in the various resolutions as well, 720p, 480p, 360p, or you can get the MP3 version, which is funny because my wife was recently trying to grab a bunch of MP3s off YouTube. This is how you do it. This is the easy way to do it. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I've been struggling with the WebM version for the Linux Action Show for a while. So, I, first of all, the encoding takes a long time, but, you know, I've, I set up a dedicated machine just to encode WebM video. Mm-hmm. Th- then the storage became an issue because all the CDNs that are, are, are designed to support web video are all designed to deliver MOV, MP4, M4V, and that's it. They don't, they don't let you upload AUG or WebM. So then you mm-hmm. just need to go to flat storage. This is like a storage dump you could just throw something on. But all of those are outrageously expensive. So, you know, it's, it's one of those deals where I keep struggling with the WebM version for the Linux Action Show. So in the meantime, while I'm figuring it all out, you could use that keepvid.com URL to just go grab the WebM version off of YouTube once it's done processing, I would imagine. So yeah, that's our picks. And all of those picks for either yep. the Android apps or the universal apps can be found in the show notes for all of them. I get that question a lot, probably on a daily basis. Where can I find the app picks? They're always in the show notes for every episode of the Linux Action Show towards the top of the show notes, and you'll find them there. All right, now what do you say we move on to the news? Yep. Yeah? You ready? All right, yep. let's do the news. All right, right Alan. <laughs> the top story on the news docket honestly was just put there because it's the one I'm the most excited about this week. Yeah. Uh, Linux Mint has been my distro of choice for, for a couple of years now, and I touched on it just a little bit last week to see if anybody in the audience would bite, and nobody did. So I want to give you guys more information so you kind of grok what the, uh, the Linux Mint project's up to. And, and as fate would have it, uh, Mulketware, I'm not sure how you want to pronounce it, did a nice blog write-up on, uh, on Mint's new secret weapon they're introducing in Mint 12 to, I believe, potentially dominate the Linux desktop. Uh, it's, it's this uh, add-on that they're building that's going to sit on top of GNOME 3. It's called the Linux, it's called the Mint GNOME Shell Extension, or what a lot of people just refer to it, and I believe Linux Mint refers to it internally, is MGSE. It's a desktop layer, is what uh, Mucketware is calling it, that sits on top of GNOME 3 that makes it more of a traditional GNOME 2-like desktop. And the great thing about it is, is you can disable the different components of MGSE to either get a pure GNOME 3 desktop or more traditional, and you can just turn it on incrementally. So you can get the traditional in the places you want it and still get the new features where you want them. Yeah, isn't that kind of... It lets you kind of hybrid the the 2 and the 3. Now, uh, Linux Mint is already rocking like the distro watch charts. I think it... I don't know if it's still like this, but... I think they're... Number one uh, now, they, right? They, yeah, they passed everybody, but that's, again, based on a shorter time range. But. And Ubuntu is down to, like, number four now, I think. It's getting pretty interesting, and I think... Well, Linux- there are, like, like we covered uh, quite a few episodes ago with that crazy chart. There are, yeah. you know, 90 derivatives of, yeah. of uh, Debian and Ubuntu. So, uh, I, I still, though, I think with this, I'll show you a screenshot if you're watching the video version. It's pretty impressive. This is a GNOME 3 desktop that we're looking at. But what will, what will strike you immediately is that it has a more traditional menu with an application bar along the bottom with your open windows. It's got system tray icons. They're specifically working on uh, a few, like music and things like that. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a lot of what I like about GNOME 3 in terms of its visual aesthetic, but uh, with the practical, more traditional, this is a real computer, not a tablet type of menu system and things like that. And... I really, I really am getting a pretty passionate vibe from the Linux community on this. I'm seeing yep. it all over the place. People are really excited about Mint 12. And when you, when they're, they're, they call GNOME 3 a task, or um, what do they call it, a task-centric or something? They, their so, problem yeah. with GNOME 3 is that it's, it's hard to switch between individual windows. So that's one of the things they're going to address on top of the application menu and the window list. Uh, uh, this could end up being a perfect Linux desktop, in my opinion. If you are a Mint fan, if you're not a Mint fan, obviously this isn't for you, but I I just, man, I think these guys have a right. I want you guys to read about it. I'll include it in the show notes, but Linux Mint 12, the RC just hit this week. I I think they're calling it Lisa, and you can go check it out. Of course, we'll have a full review when it, uh, when it hits the uh, the uh, internets. Well, also, I think uh, we're on, I think we're slated to to do the new OpenSUSE release next week. Um, So people should stay tuned for that. 
All right. Mm-hmm. Now, this next story is the real news, the meat of it. And uh, it's, it's finally, 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 somebody has the nuts to stand up to Microsoft and fight against what they're doing with all of these Linux inf- infringement suits and mm-hmm. patent licensing deals. Barnes kind of and a, Noble. Unexpected source for that, eh? Yeah. Did, like, did you really think that would be the, 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 the group that would stand up to Microsoft? Uh, Barnes & Noble, too, is telling them like it is, which is awesome. Uh, so yeah. th- this last week, Barnes & Noble uh, sent uh, a letter qu- basically uh, allegating Microsoft of antitrust abuse, and they sent it up to uh, the... Uh, Department of Justice. Yeah, the Department of Justice Chief Competition Counsel, Gene Kimmelman, on October 17th. So this is... They're, they're saying that uh, Microsoft, Microsoft's anti-Android patent licensing campaign is meant to artificially drive competition and make companies choose Windows-based platforms. And the yeah. way they go on to say, check this out, actually. Uh, so Barnes & Noble has had lots of different conversations with Microsoft. And in the past, after those conversations, they had accused Microsoft of setting unrealistically high royalty rates that would hike the price of its Android-based Nook readers by a significant margin. The reason is Microsoft purportedly wanted to charge more than a phone because of the Nook's vague similarity to a tablet, which has a vague similarity to a computer. So you know, we've heard of like anywhere between seven to fifteen dollar licensing agreement with phone manufacturers. Barnes is Noble saying they wanted more than that because it's a computer. Yeah. And what Microsoft effectively does with this is by Google giving away Android for free and Microsoft coming in and licensing those individual parts they own in Android to these different companies, what they're saying is this individual component of Android, this VFAT driver or whatever it is, is worth more than the entire operating system as a whole. <laughs> and, they're, and you have to license that. And I believe that's the, that's the, uh, that's the premise that Barnes & Noble is going to attack in court, yeah. I hope. I hope that's what they're going mm-hmm. for, because they're right. They call out Microsoft. What this is purely Microsoft trying to step on competition for people for sure. not using and, the Windows platform. Yeah. And, and it's, it's ridiculous that Microsoft's making the most money out of anybody off Android. I know, I know. I think it, it surprised me that Barnes & Noble was the company to, to step up and, and spearhead this out of everybody out there. But I, at maybe, the same time, if, if they own the VFAT driver, why are they not, for example, suing camera manufacturers for the VFAT driver that they use to write to the SD cards? Well, I should make it clear, I'm not positive that's what they're suing over, but, right, the, but, but the reason why I think the, it is the, well, the worst part driver is, is that because they have they have sued camera makers yeah, for yeah. it. So. But at the same time, we have, you know, Microsoft's being very vague about what they're suing on, right? That they're yeah. never disclosing what these patents are. That way they can get and you. hopefully Barnes & Noble stands up to them when we get a list and we can invalidate all of them. I think Barnes & Noble's like, Microsoft, we're trying to make the book platform of the future. And Barnes & Noble rightly, I think, recognizes too that uh, their, they need, their e-reader is yeah. critical to the success of their business. Yeah, they, they, yeah. If they want to, if books are going to continue, it's going to be on e-readers. Mm-hmm. And right now, their only major competitor is Amazon, and so they want to not get stepped on by Microsoft. And I've, I've read, I don't know, but I've read that Amazon is in a licensing deal with Microsoft. So I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems to be true. All right, let's talk about my next potential gadget because you know I've, I've been rocking this uh, Galaxy Tab Seven Inch Original Edition since like. Uh, Actually, only for a year. That's kind of pathetic. It feels, it feels like it's three years old, but I just realized that I got it last December. Anyways, the device I think I might want to replace this with is the Asus E, 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 whatever, e, triple, triple E pad Transformer Prime. Now, we've talked about this before on the show, but we've got some details, including the fact that it's going to sell, sell for $499 this December. It's a 10-inch mm. IPS display with a 12-hour battery and a quad-core, and I'm putting quad-core in air quotes, Tegra 3 chi- uh, chip in it. It, uh, yeah, which apparently is the graphics are good enough to compete with like the embedded cards and desktops. Oh, I've I've got a clip here of the graphics I'll show in a minute. Yeah, it looks it looks really impressive. Also, the display is IPS plus or what super that, IPS plus. What does that mean exactly? Other than I know I, it gives you an insane described, viewing angle. Uh, some other page about it. We talked. I think we talked about it last week. I think about what the what it means i forget i know one thing it means is it has 100 and it has 178 degree viewing angle and a max brightness of 600 nits whatever that means right that's what it is the plus uh, a typical ips display only does 500 nits but the ips plus does okay. 600 that's so what the, it was the big thing i think everybody knows about the transformer is it's it's asus's uh, android tablet that also has a keyboard dock that you can you can optionally get uh, this unit is also this this uh, optional keyboard dock 
We'll also have an, a mini HDMI output, a micro SD slot, and I believe, although I don't see it here in the specs, a, a USB port, which would be really great on a tablet. Uh, you combine that with the NVIDIA Tegra 3 system on a chip, uh, one gig of RAM. You can get it in 32 gig storage for, uh, for the base price or 64 gigs for a little more. A 1280 by 800 display is pretty nice. It's got GPS too. It also has a, a, a 1.2 megapixel front-facing camera, an 8 megapixel camera in the back with autofocus, an F24 lens, a back-illuminated CMOS, that's what the iPhone 4S is well known for, and, okay. a ten and 1080p video. They're saying that the tablet will be able to squeeze 12 hours of battery life thanks to its 22-watt-hour battery. But if you add the dock, you get an additional six hours of juice. Right, because of the extra battery? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there it is. USB 2.0 slot in the dock. There, they list it in the specs. So, uh, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. $500 is a little steep, but uh, here's a... I got right, but that's, that's still like $200 cheaper than an iPad, right? I, 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 uh, I think the iPad starts at $499. I'm not sure. But look at these now. Here, Alan, here's a, here's a video of, of the graphics on this thing. This guy's playing... Uh, a, uh, a SWAT gun or something like that. I missed the name, but it looks so sweet. And the audio, you can't hear it because you know, I don't have the audio feed out, but the audio sounds really great too. And, it's, and the other thing, this looks so strong from a pretty dramatic angle. So the IPS display really is performing pretty well because it does not look like it's been diminished at all in terms of quality, and they're shooting it at an angle, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so I and, got some pics you know, here of it. And it they just, barely accomplished that with desktop displays. So. <laughs> I would say my biggest, my biggest gripe with it is that out of the gate, it's uh, not going to ship with ice cream. Right. Ice cream sandwich. They uh, supposedly are going to have an update in December or early January where they will be adding ice cream sandwich over the air. Right. But for, you know, uh, if, if it's going to be on sale in stores in the next couple of weeks, that means it's already been made and, and it's like in the process of being shipped. So oh, they a, could. They have an interesting comparison to the iPhone 4 and it's thinner than the iPhone 4. And uh, it's got a metal metallic back. Oh mm. man, this thing just looks so nice. It looks like a laptop when you put it in that dang dock. But yeah, uh, well, a, a netbook, right? That's the whole point. Yeah, it looks, it's, supposed yeah. To be, it's basically a ten-inch netbook once you dock it. Boy, oh boy, I'm excited about this thing. So it, five hundred dollars is a little out of my price range right now. But boy, you talk about you talk okay, about being yeah. able to get twelve hours of. That's what they said. They said twelve hours of battery life, which would be phenomenal for an Android like, tablet. Like my ten-inch uh, netbook only gets about eight hours. Yeah, that's not bad though for a netbook. It was like three ninety-nine. And, and that, was, the, but that was like two years ago. The but. keyboard's like 150 bucks extra. So you got it, and you kind of, so you spend 500 bucks, you kind of got to get the keyboard, right? Because then you get the USB port, micro SD card reader, and six hours extra battery, plus you can type. That just seems yeah. like a total win. So, uh, and something else that's a total win for uh, tablets and mobile platforms Adobe, everyone, I know everyone has probably heard this story. Adobe is officially discontinuing development for Flash on mobile platforms. What do you think of this, Alan? Not exactly happy about it. Like the web hasn't uh, abandoned Flash enough yet that I want to give up Flash on my cell phone. I'll tell you, uh, it was you know one of the major selling points of my Android phone was the fact that it ran Flash, and so I could still access yeah. anything I want. Well, they'll, con they'll continue to maintain the version that's been released, and you know I generally don't yeah, but find. We, how often do we see security updates for that? Quite often. So yeah, that's true. If they're not actively developing it, are we not going to? Are we going to see those take they, a lot longer? They out? claim they'll provide the patches, but for how long we don't know. And yeah, we don't know what the turnaround will be. I'll, you know, I've never found Flash to be very good on the mobile device, but one of the few times where I've really needed Flash support was when I'm walking around downtown Seattle and I'm out and about on the go, and I want to look up this restaurant that we want to go to. And this happens a lot with like uh, video games, restaurant sites, and Music sites, the entire site is completely done in Flash. Yeah. Every, like, it doesn't load anything not in the Flash. Or like, you know, like if you want to go check like a movie trailer site, something like that, they're always in effing Flash. Yeah. Um, Adobe, though, uh, Adobe had a really cryptic, hard to read uh, public announcement about this. But one of their uh, technical engineers took to the web, to his blog specifically, and, and kind of gave us the rational reasons why Adobe killed uh, mobile flash. Some of them are pretty obvious, but some of them are interesting to actually hear them admit. Like they mentioned that HTML5 is already the most universally supported um, web standard in mobile browsers. Like today, it's already right, but there's been done. there's no live in HTML5 really. Well, it works. We we are experimenting with that with that very thing right now, and we can attest to this hit and miss for different different devices. Yeah. Well, and that's uh, you know the, specifically been set up like HTML5. 
for video on demand for like existing episodes of the Linux Action Show. Oh, yeah. That we have that. Yeah. But for the live stream, we don't actually have no, an it's... HTML5 one. Right? We have, you know, pop it out externally in VLC or watch it in Flash. Well, what do people, you know, but people can watch it on their, uh, on their Androids or on the iPhones in the web browser right now. It's, it's, it's an H264 so that's not stream. H- yeah, but that's not uh, HTML5. Just the media player support of the browser on the operating system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other and problem... The, and, you know, desktop Firefox and Chrome do not support H.264, only right. WebM. Right. And, and uh, our media server can't do WebM, and neither does Flash Media Server. There's, you know, not really a media server that does. So you can only do pseudo streaming. Right. And that's not as good and doesn't work for live. So... I think they HTML5 were more... live for live video is not there yet. And the other thing... And I know a lot of people don't care about this, but... Uh, content publishers do the other thing that html5 video doesn't have an answer for yet is uh, ad overlays you know those little annoying yep. lower third ads i know everybody hates those things but for some people it's how they video make their bandwidth living. is ex- video bandwidth is expensive yeah and uh you know yeah. those ads offset some of that cost we blew those, through nobody make- we blew through 150 gigs just for the live stream yesterday right 180 gigs yeah. 180 gigs so you, you know you imagine like having to pay for that it's just kind of it's kind of insane and so the ad revenue helps offset that but html the the, the, that whole like little lower third transparency thing that's an alpha channel that flash supports that there's you could probably do it with javascript somehow with html5 but but, uh when you do that i it's i imagine that it's going to cause like stuttering in the video while it's animating that slide up and everything right like i've had this issue while watching uh netflix again that's the silly silver light player Ugh. but when a little skype message pops up before it even starts popping up my video starts lagging and then the the slide up is like stuttering and my whole machine is like crying yeah. because it's trying to animate this little lower third slide up about the fact that i got a skype message and so i i expect similar problem if you're trying to do an html5 video with a a, a javascript mm. div floating over it or something mm. or you're going to get flickering or tearing or because the video is accelerated the ad will slide up behind it and you won't be able to see it because the browser's offloading the drawing of the video to the video card right so it can't render in front of it because it, it's right. handling still the video ad right um, and the, so yeah the other point that, problems the other point that they touched on is that uh the pro the proliferation of apps sort of take people off the web more. And those apps are always using HTML5 based video if they do use it. And then, now this one I thought might be kind of damning to Google, but they don't exactly call out Google. Is he says, fragmentation. To make Flash work on mobile platforms, Adobe had to work with multiple hardware makers like Motorola, Samsung, platform companies such as Google and RIM, and component manufacturers like NVIDIA and ARM and so on and so forth to make Flash work. And they said it was just took too much time and it realized they simply could not scale it. Because Flash was such a pig, they had to custom tailor it to make it function at all on all those machines. Yeah. Uh, it just seems to me like if, if they want Flash to continue to be used anywhere on the web, that it has to be supported on every device. This and is, if it's not, then that's more reason for people to stop using Flash. This is clearly the um, you know, beginning of the end, I would think, for Flash, right? Even on the desktop. Even though it's so massively deployed. Yeah, it's just that the, the main problem is that if you want to do HTML5 video, that means WebM now. Yeah. It yeah. means H.264 and like we just is said, there's over. Some issues around that. Yeah, and, and it's not there yet. Like, there's no live video except for Flash or RTSP. And RTSP has its own issues with the fact that it was designed such that you connect to the server, ask it for the stream, and then the server connects back to you twice, once for audio, once for video. So they're not actually um, mucks together. Right. The audio and video are separate streams. And it causes problems for people behind NAT or and and firewalls and stuff. That's pretty. That's a that's a pretty big amount of people. It's pretty much almost right. everybody and, these days. You know, RTSP is is you know not a great standard. It's really old and not that useful. Uh, and so basically, <laughs> we run into all these problems. Yeah, yeah. Although at the same time, you, Flash has its own set of problems, right? So yeah. And so I was trying to get like HTTP live streaming to work in Firefox, but it doesn't. And even if it did, the issue is that. There's no H.264 support. Right, right. Yeah, I really wish H.264 and, you know, could just be open. Right now, uh, well, yeah, but it's patent and covered, so I it'll know. never be. I know. So that leaves the option of WebM, and right now, for example, Wirecast doesn't support outputting WebM to the live stream. Nothing really does. And our, and our streaming server doesn't support it, and no other existing streaming server does. No, and... Uh, you know, in the future, we'll have WebM for video on demand, mm-hmm. but not for live, as far as I know. 
Yeah, I really would really like to see that get pushed forward. I just, I'm so dying to uh, to move beyond this current set of issues that I feel like we've been struggling with for what feels like a couple of years now. Uh, let's talk about um, some good news. We talk an awful lot on the show about people getting sued over Linux patents and this and that over patents. And some companies are actually stepping up and trying to just make all the silliness stop. And mm-hmm. that is HTC and LG. They've joined uh, the patent protection pool that is called, I got the name right here. I remember it's actually been announced a little while ago on the show. Open Innovation Network. That's what it was. And uh, they are joining, when, so HTC and LG, when you do this kind of uh, partnership with, an, with the Open Innovation Network, you license your, you, the patents that you own to the entire pool. And then they also license the patents that the other respective companies own. You know, companies like Google, IBM, HP, and Sony. Now, I don't know if it's, I, I would highly doubt it's all of their patents. I'm sure it's just applicable Right, just the to, ones, re- and particularly ones that are uh, related to Linux and, and Android. Hmm. Now, uh, somebody in the chat room saying that HTC joining the uh, Open Innovation Network on May also opened up the S3 TC patent uh, to, um, to the, the MESA project, or MESA, I've never pronounced it out loud, uh, for Xorg. And XORG, right. that's really good. So, so XORG is getting benefited from that too. Now, what, what I think is actually um, kind of interesting here is they also licensed from another company that's just essentially a patent troll company called Intellectual Ventures. That might be Paul, uh, Paul what's his face? Like, you know, Paul Allen's uh, company. But uh, with all of this, they got 35,000 IP sets and in 50 different technology areas. So, you know, in other words, bring it, Microsoft, because. Uh, Mm-hmm. We're we're banding together, and you know we, we've seen these kind of things happen before, and that's, I in my opinion, watching this in the pa- in the past, the only thing that sort of stopped this steamrolling lawsuit practice has been these types of groups where yep. everyone just sort of amasses this massive coalition of of weapons against the person that's doing all of it. In this case, Microsoft. So it's a good step forward for HTC and LG, and it's a good step forward apparently for the Xorg project. So that's pretty awesome too. I didn't even know that. And uh, links to all of this stuff is in the show notes if you guys want to grab that. Now, before we go on to the uh, Fedora 16 review, I want to announce the Jupiter Signal. That's Jupiter yes. Broadcasting's new monthly newsletter, because you know I'm doing this full time. We're launching new shows because I have more time. We're also making changes and improving things like, things like here's a perfect example of what will make it in the Jupiter Broadcasting's monthly newsletter, the Jupiter Signal. Uh, so hopefully, if everything goes as planned, starting next week, I'll have an HD RSS feed for the Linux Action Show. Now, how do oh, I nice. tell people that? You know, I could mention the show, but if I forget, which I always do, nobody knows, so it just sits there and nobody uses it. So we'll incorporate things like that. Probably some of our best Android picks from the show yep. will go into the monthly newsletter. Uh, I think Angela also said the most... Um, Downloaded episodes for the month or something Yeah, the like most that. popular episode for the month mm-hmm. uh, and a bunch mm-hmm. of other things. Yeah, so uh, we'll probably get that out in the first week of December to keep you guys up to date on all of the new stuff we'll be rolling out at Jupiter Broadcasting. There will be a spot in the show notes where I'll just have an embed. You can just sign up right there uh, for this episode of Linux Action Show. Or if you want to just type it in your browser, you can go to bit.ly slash Signal and sign up for the monthly newsletter. I'm, I'm really excited because we've been brainstorming. It's one of these little projects we've worked on that we've just had a lot of little awesome ideas for us so Mm -hmm. getting it out there is going to be a lot of fun and and i added a couple and i think it's going to be really really cool Mm -hmm. and uh, we promise not to spam which is always nice too because uh yes if Uh, we do if we do spam uh, mailchimp actually sends a chimp out to my house and beats the crap out of me yeah that's that's what happens so i can't spam yeah it's it's a very reputable uh, service that wants to make sure that they don't get flagged to spam in their uh so that they can keep their delivery rates up so they're very picky what if i get everybody to sign up and then I spam them, and then I hang out here in the live on the, in the studio with the live stream up, and then the monkey comes in here, and I get in the monkey fight that Mailchimp sent on the live stream. That could work. So that might happen. So if you start seeing spam from us, assume that uh, I'm probably planning to get in a fight with a monkey. Yeah. All right, Alan. Yeah, monkey brawl live on jblive.tv. That's right. That's right. And you can watch it in VLC now. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Alan. Well, that's all the news for this week. All right, it's time for the Linux Action Show to review Fedora 16. So grab your Fedora lookalike hat if you have one, or perhaps you have an actual Fedora, unlike me, and let's review this sucker. Now, of course, the Linux Action Show has had some controversial Fedora reviews in the past. We thought maybe this time we'd balance things out, so we've invited another host to join us. His name is Randall, and he's a member of Stokes Guild Jupiter Force, and he's the sysadmin for about 240 Linux servers over at Coca-Cola, or at least 
one of the admins. Hey, Randall, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And you're a big Red Hat user, aren't you? Yeah, actually, that's all we use there. Yeah. Only yeah, because of the support and stuff, you know, it it's, makes it easy. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you here, too, because I know one of Fedora's stronger areas that I don't spend a lot of time on on this show is the virtualization tool. So towards the end of the review, I think we should spend a little bit of time on that because it's, yeah. it's definitely one of its stronger areas. So I think they deserve to get their, their uh, well, well dues there. Now, uh, Fedora 16, it's probably its biggest feature is using Linux kernel 3.1. And it's, it ships with either KDE Plasma Workspace 4.7 or GNOME 3.2. Bit mm -hmm. controversial there on that last part. It does ship with Firefox 7. And uh, I, I loaded it on a VM, which will be available in the show notes for download. Or, I, I, not, not available for download, but I also used it on my HP laptop. Now, did either one of you guys get a chance to kick it around very much? Yeah, um, I used a live disk and a uh, virtual. And the live CD... Um, you, it has more access to like the 3D features. Um, like if you use a virtual machine, it's kind of like toned down a bit. Yep. Um, yep. To get the well, fair experience of like the desktop. In like, fact, that's what I'll be showing here on the on the video version is the uh, 2D experience. And you, actually, there's some elements to the 2D GNOME fallback version that I kind of like because it's got a more traditional menu structure and it's a little easier. Actually, I thought to to get to some of the programs. So there's some elements of their fallback UI that I I actually I don't think are too bad. No, uh, the fallback feature is actually pretty good. Um, you have to get used to the 3D uh, experience a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can see where GNOME is going, and then actually it's, it's a pretty good idea, in my opinion. I'll say this. Fedora 16, there's a lot of elements that are done pretty well. The art team, I think, went above and beyond. The, uh, the, visual, the visual layout and look of the desktop is, 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 is pretty stunning, really. The, the cool underwater background with the, with the GNOME 3 black highlights. But I'll be honest. I think some of the reason why the art team was so successful is because GNOME 3 is pretty beautiful just out of the box. It um, is. One of the things that bothered me was as you started digging around the desktop, there's some pretty ugly parts on it, like the, the icons are just... I know I say this before, but why not replace those with something a little more aesthetic that matches the rest of the desktop? They're just so old. So, I don't know, like GNOME 1 looking. Mm -hmm. uh, I know nobody really cares about that, but my point is, is that it does look like a very beautiful Fedora release. I, I don't know how much, though, is really due to some of the artwork's work, other than just a great background and some other choices. The Grub 2 loader, really ugly. The boot-up process is, is fairly ge generic looking. And the reason why I think these things are important is they're all first impressions. They sort of set the user's expectation as to the level of sophistication of the operating system, in my opinion. I believe those visual things... Uh, go unappreciated in in uh, in some releases, and I think this might be one of them. And I know Grub Grub Two is new, but I did have some issue with that. It's possible, but at the same time, isn't less eye candy more? noting a more s sophisticated OS, depending on depending on how it's what done. your definition of sophisticated is. D depending on how it's done, I would agree with you, Alan. I would I would say if if uh, if it's a simple, clean look to it, then yeah, that actually can be an advantage. Sort of like that to do app that I talked about at the top of the show. It's I meant more along the lines of if it's less pure elegant. flooded geekiness, then you know that it... Yeah, I, I, it depends on who your target audience is, and that's... Right. Uh, sophistication isn't necessarily synonymous with complication. <laughs> True, absolutely. And, and I would say this, too, that uh, I, if, you, if you alter who you think the uh, Fedora target audience is from the desktop user, and you change that in your mind to the server audience and the uh, users like Randall here then that kind of stuff doesn't matter as much. And I right. think that's kind of what I'm looking at Fedora 16 as, is Fedora 16, I don't think is a great desktop release. I really don't. Uh, the things that continue to struggle, the, the things that I continue to struggle with in Fedora really sort of dumbfound me. Like, for an example, if I go in and say I just want to listen to, uh, watch a podcast, and uh, I've got a podcast that I've subscribed to, and I just go in here, and it's, maybe it's a video podcast like the Linux Action Show, you can, you know, you can easily enough begin to download and subscribe to podcasts, but then you run into a wall as soon as you go to watch it. It asks, it asks if you have, if you want to get the H.264 decoder. Okay, great. Yes, I would like to do that. And then when you search for the H.264 decoder, and, and recall, Fedora pioneered Codec Buddy, the thing that was supposed to help you get around this, it immediately fails out of the box. Then if you click more information, like I've complained about before, it's just unbelievable to me. It takes you to a wiki page that explains why patents are evil and then tells you to go use a third-party repo. And what I realized is, is what bugs me about Fedora doing this is it, is, it feels exactly like Apple. 
It feels like Apple is controlling how Steve Jobs would say, no, that's not how you use the computer. You can't do that. Fedora feels the same way. Yeah, they're controlling over things that are free and open, and that's awesome, but they still are setting how I should use my desktop. And if I don't follow that, then I'm going outside the bounds and the Fedora team's hands off. Sorry, we're not going to make that easier for you. We're not going to make it so you can play MP3s. We're not going to make it so you can watch H.264 video. We're not even going to make it so it's easy. We're not even going to make it so you can do it, but after four or five clicks, it's just not going to work. And then we're going to tell you to go use a third-party repo, but we're not going to tell you what that means or what that is or how you do it unless you go to that repo and maybe they explain it to you. But if they don't, eh, go screw yourself. You probably shouldn't be using that anyways. You're a bad person. And that's what Fedora feels like to me. It feels like Steve Jobs is making a Linux distro. If Steve Jobs was an open source bigot, he'd be making Fedora. But, yeah, but most of that, How am I wrong? Um, it's a uh, patent issue. I it's, know what uh, it is, but there's no reason they can't give us tools like every other single distribution does. Ubuntu does it. Ubuntu is, has such a larger deployment on desktops than Fedora does. It dwarfs Fedora, and they haven't been sued over it. So this BS argument that it's legal reasons for patents is crap because every other distro out there does it, and they haven't gotten sued. So that's been proven wrong. Just because you haven't gotten sued doesn't mean it's not a legal issue. And, exactly. uh, but, they have come up with solutions that work around, and the, and the fact of the matter is, if every other company is out there doing it, you could just point to them and go, well, you also have to sue all of these people. Mm -hmm. I think it's bigotry. I don't think it's anything else. At, at early on, I bought into it. Oh, yeah, it's freedom. Oh, yeah, it won't fit on the disc. Whatever the crap reason was. This time, I just think it's pig-headedness, and it bothers mm -hmm. the crap out of me, because well, that's it why seems, I don't like Apple. Right, but it seems like it's a bit of a disconnect where, you know, it, the codec buddy says, all right, click here to get it, and then it used to get it for you, but then yeah. they pointed that to a wiki, and yeah. it just seems like it's unmaintained. Or, here's an example. Maybe I want to install the number one up-and-coming browser on the web today, Chrome. How do you do that? How do you do that on Fedora? Again, you got to go get a third-party repo with packages that are maintained by some other person, not Fedora, add that, then figure out how to install that. It, it boggles the frickin' mind that these simple desktop tasks are unavailable. So, Given that evidence, I've come to the only conclusion that Fedora is not meant for the desktop. Fedora is only meant for people like Randall. <laughs> so, Randall, that's why you're here. So, tell me what you like about Fedora, because I know you've uh, pretty much, I have to agree with you, though. Um, the desktop is fine. I mean, if you don't want to use... Um, pretty much, I think Fedora is basically geared for the server. Uh, it has more tools for server. It actually has a lot of uh, useful tools for, you know, setting up servers, deploying yes, servers. Yes, it does. Um, it seems almost more like a, a workstation... Desktop exactly. Than, than a home desktop. Exactly. Yeah, and, and of course, those things that I complained about, eventually, you know, you can work through, and then they're fixed, and they're done. It's just... Wow. It's, so get it, me started on package repos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> just... my whole stance on that. It's, it's just not an acceptable answer, in my opinion. Um, so if I was like Randall here, and I was using it as a desktop, as a workstation, that might be a little different. But I know, Randall, one of the things you wanted to talk about is sort of their embracing of server in the cloud, even OpenStack, which is technically a competitor to Red Hat. you want to mm -hmm. chat about that at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, the tools that they introduced into this, uh, you, know, they're, you know, Fedora is pretty much like a beta. Um, the new OpenStack um, for cloud services, you know, it makes it easy so you can just, you know, it's modular so you can add a server and then, you know, configure it with the web interface, just point to it and say, hey, here's a new server, I want to add it to cloud. And then from what I used in, you know, the virtual environment in uh, VirtualBox, it was pretty easy to, you know, add new servers as you went along. Yeah. And I, it was a really the tools and the uh, you got to use some little command line, but most of it you can do it through a, a GUI interface. But uh, but it was really easy just to get it onto the you know network inter uh, the web interface, and it worked just fine. I was actually pretty impressed with that. I agree, and I think that they're uh, they it's it's a GNOME three two feature, but it's still in Fedora, so it counts. Uh, you can go into GNOME. Go into the settings, and you can, this is not server related, this is client side, you can add a Google account in there, and you're done. Now Evolution's fully syncing with Google. I opened up Evolution, all my emails there, all of my calendar, calendar appointments are there. Fedora's talked a lot about the cloud lately, and I, I really think that's an interesting standpoint um, that they're focusing on, but I think that kind of backs up my argument that they're not really targeting the desktop. In fact, if you look at, I don't know if I have it handy here. I don't actually, crap. Maybe I'll add the link to the show notes. If you look at the Fedora 16 release notes, there's mm -hmm. not even a section in there for desktop, right? They have a section in the Fedora release notes for amateur radio operators, but they <laughs> don't even have a section in there to talk about anything that they have done on the desktop. And I'll see if I can find the, the, uh, the uh, show notes, because I think that speaks to 
the focus of the Fedora project. And maybe it speaks to a little bit of conflict inside the Fedora project, maybe because they have maybe. a dedicated art team and things like that. But when it comes to the actual release notes here, yeah, here's the shot. There's, uh, you know, you have welcome, you have things about the kernel, you have UID range changes, which is, you know, important, and database servers, system daemons. But, you know, nothing in here about, about any of this crap that's important to people like codec support or video playback or any of that stuff. And I guess it depends on your philosophy. Like with, with FreeBSD, the desktop portion of the release notes is the package repo now contains GNOME X and KDE Y. Yeah. Have fun. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Fedora's like, approach. They, they, don't, they don't do anything to it. You get stock GNOME or stock KDE. You don't even get a fancy background or different icons unless that's a separate package somebody else made. Maybe uh, this is um, Linux's FreeBSD. It's more meant for... Mm. Not necessarily, but I think, like we were saying, it, it's more about the workstation than the, the desktop, right? Desktop is kind of the, the home thing, and Fedora is basically a workstation instead, mm -hmm. right? So it has a different focus on uh, tools and automation and so on, and less on, you know, multimedia playback and exactly. music and so on. Well, now, Randall, it's let me ask you this. Do you use Fedora on your work desktop? Uh, actually, I I, uh, I use Arch, but I do have a couple of uh, computers <laughs> there that have uh, Fedora. I use Fedora on my laptop. Uh, I dual boot it. So, yeah. Well, I I I don't want to I don't want to seem like an always Fedora hitter. I'm I'm monitoring the chat room right now, and it seems to be kind of a mix in there. They they say they have some stuff in there. Oh, changes for desktop users. Yeah, I I I, I know it. Here, I'll show you guys if you want to see it. It's it's crap. It's total crap in here. It's. It's not, it's like, it's stuff that no regular user is going to know anything to do with, like write type and OO2GD and hot tot and LK. I mean, nobody knows what any of this crap All is. All that is is a list of the packages they updated. It's, it's not anything they yeah. did. Yeah. And Fedora is pretty much for the more, I guess, experienced user, uh, or as Ubuntu is from, you know, newbies to like, you know, very advanced. But um, Fedora pretty much starts after, you need to know a little think, bit about the uh, yeah, desktop. I'm, I'm, what Fedora is, is for the person that spends all day working with Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS and yeah. wants a desktop. And exactly. So they're already familiar with all the tools and how the package repos mm -hmm. work and everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas exactly. If, if you're starting fresh, you're not going to go with Fedora. But Fedora is just the desktop version in the ecosystem you're used to living in. And I think that's, yeah. I think that's a good fit for it. I think that makes sense. And yeah. if I change my perspective to that, I'm more okay with it. And like you've mentioned, they have some great tools. And so in that area, they're actually a pretty strong performer. If, if I went with a Linux desktop, it may likely be Fedora just because the Linux, when I have to use Linux, the one I use is CentOS. Hmm. And so I know more about its package management system and just where, where all the files are laid out and so on. Says the guy who built an Ubuntu mining rig. Uh, that was because the video the drivers driver, were more yeah. up to date. The, actually, the video <laughs> driver the, is a is a is a holdover issue that I have on my. Um, I have two issues that are, are continue to be issues on my HP NV17, and that is the trackpad is really funky. And I did this time. I went out and looked, and I saw other people with Synaptic trackpads complaining that it 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 reads your right click wrong and it doesn't scroll. And the other issue is is it doesn't backlight my LCD screen. So my LCD screen is very, very, very dark under Fedora. And this doesn't happen, and I, I don't, I, I'm assuming it it's does, a video You don't driver. have, like, a, a hardware setting for that? I have, like, soft buttons, you know, on the keyboard. Right. And I tap those, actually. and the on-screen visualizer that registers, like, a little increase in your brightness, that shows up. But the brightness doesn't go up. <laughs> huh. And it was an issue in Fedora 15 for me as I well. Think, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure on my machine there's, like, a hardware fallback. So that if the software isn't running to register the soft button, then the BIOS takes over and actually exactly right. Yeah. Well, and, and it works like gotta... under every other desktop and every other distro. So I'm not. It's not like a debilitating issue for me. And then, so I'm sure I could figure out under Fedora how to fix it. Right. Yeah. And like I know I'm gonna get a lot of flame from this, but I run Fedora on my MacBook, um, and the the you know brightness features uh, like Alan was saying, it falls back to the hardware if it, it's not installed. Oh, but once you it. install the uh, open source drivers, but they you know made for Mac. Um, the screen works like you know the you know the menu showing like how high the brightness and stuff is. The other funny thing I got, uh, which is funny because people gave me the hardest time about this the last time I reviewed it, is uh, I have two hard drives in my uh, HP Envy, and oh, uh, Fedora. I completely forgot that Fedora 15 did this until Fedora 16 started doing this. I get inundated with pop-ups saying my hard drive is failing. 
<laughs> it, no, no, no other OS does this. And I've run like uh, Spinrite on it to check for bad sectors, and you know, it doesn't. Nothing's ever found anything. And and then Fedora itself offers to launch the tool, but I can't ever tell if it's actually scanning the drive or what it's doing. And then it just continues to report it. But here's the pain in the ass thing. In GNOME 3, you know, Windows by default are completely maximized. And if a dialog box, like so, say the installer, has next buttons down below in the bottom corner, well, the GNOME 3 prompt keeps coming up over the next button, so I can't mm -hmm. click the effing next button. <laughs> <laughs> so then I have to wonder, did anybody else run into this? And if they did, did they ship it like that? Like, who <laughs> I, thinks I'm it's okay to ship it? Yeah, if you get a lot, of, if you don't get a lot of errors, it's not an issue because it rarely comes up. And and like the, mo the 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 removable device ones are more centered, right? They're in the middle of the uh, of the screen instead of taking up the whole yeah. bottom bar. But different notifications take up different areas, and that's the one that blocks the uh, the next problem. It's just the one thing I really love about Fedora is their pre-upgrade. Their pre-upgrade system is probably one of the best used. I have not had it fail. I mean, I had it fail once where you know can re uh, get a package and it failed to download correctly, mm. but it failed back to the previous, you know, the kernel boot, um, and it booted back in. So I never had a pre-upgrade actually fail to where my system was unusable, or I, I can get, so I'll back if it fails, I get back in, run the pre-upgrade again, and it goes, continues in the very way. Pre-upgrade is a very useful tool. Like, you know, you have Fedora 15, you just do pre-upgrade, and right. it checks and gets all the packages it needs to upgrade to the next version, and uh, it nice. does pretty well. That is nice. I'll tell you, they have every release revved yum a little bit more and a little bit more and now yum is a great tool and their software selection tool is a little on the light side and it's a little slow like when you search because it has to query the yum database and stuff but like updates and whatnot are really fast like they they must be fully utilizing the whole delta update process because like some of my updates were less than 200 kilobytes and they just went zip exactly. zip 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 and and that's uh, what i love about the new um yum that they use for you know a delta rpms um yes. and it's very quick to do an upgrade. Yeah, um, it's, it's actually really impressive. Yeah. Do you know and, um, uh, what like binary diff tool they're using for that? Not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> no I'm not sure. Uh, did, Aunt Randall, did you, t did you chat all about your thoughts on them embracing OpenStack and Fedora? Because it's technically a Red Hat competitor. What it is. That? But, you know, Fedora, it, you don't know, think that they're, you know, part of Red Hat. They are, but they're a community brand uh, Right, it's not actually. Project. Yeah. Um, the but Red Hat this is. This is just, it's uh, showing you that the Fedora project's not totally bound to uh, Red Hat, but it allows you to have some, you know, opportunities to test. But it also lets Red Hat keep a little skin in that game without fully endorsing it or putting mm -hmm. a lot of financial resources behind it. Exactly. I mean, um, they can test it, see how it works, and see how what's, you know, how maybe they might use the technology later or not. Now, uh, as a Red Hat Enterprise user, pretty heavily Red Hat Enterprise user, I'm sure you look at Fedora and you think, okay, if they're doing X in Fedora, I'll probably see X in an iteration or two of Red Hat Enterprise down the road. Is there anything you saw in Fedora 16 that you're kind of looking at and saying, boy, I hope they bring that to the Enterprise the, distro? Yeah, I love all of the uh, virtual machine and cloud uh, web interfaces. It was really easy and intuitive. I would really love to see that, like the next version of uh, Sen OS or Red Hat. Yeah, their uh, their web platform is what Alios, I believe. It's a cross platform uh, web management uh, tool that they're including. Uh, I have a, I have a shot of it here. I don't really know much about it, but they call it. It's, it dubs itself as the, be the meet the world's best cloud management software, and it's oh, free. it is it is great. I would yeah. have to say that I really really hope this gets in. If not, I'll just have to use Fedora for a while until I get it in. <laughs> <laughs> this looks really sweet. Yeah, it's open source, so I got to. I'm leaving that tab open after the show so I can read it's it. It's really easy. I mean, it's um to get more. To add more to the infrastructure is just mind-boggling how easy it is. And I was like, mm -hmm. I shouldn't need my Red Hat server for this, but it's how easy it is. It's really easy to add stuff. That's cool. Any other thoughts, you guys, before we wrap up the review here of Fedora 16? No, um, no but I would just like to make it, uh, and just like to back up Fedora on the, the loading the JPEGs faster. I use that every day because, you know. Are you seriously on here defending LibTurbo JPEG right now? Well, only, I only found one use for it is that when you have like massive, like if you go to the NASA website and have these massive images. 16 megabyte JPEG. Yeah, exactly. That actually increases the load time almost by uh, about 0.5%. So it, it looks pretty good. Really? Okay. All right. So, wow, there you go. An actual defendant and a, a, and a logical reason why LibJPEG was an amazing upgrade. So Fedora 15's legacy lives on. 
that was introduced then. So <laughs> yay. Uh, Mr. Mango <laughs> asked that I put a link to that uh, cool cloud management software in the show notes. So I just tossed that in there. So we, cause I was yeah. going to ask the same thing cause I hadn't heard of this one yet. Yeah. I'm okay. There you go. Yeah. Shopping around for similar things. It'll be in the show notes. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, reviewing Fedora 16. Now don't forget, go over to the show notes. You can download a VM image of a nearly vanilla installed fedora so you if you want to see some of the things i ran into like with the codex stuff and a couple of other issues that i had you can see those as well but uh overall i think if like these guys are saying i'll i'll, I'll buy on to that if you're a desktop if you're a workstation user like a corporate workstation user especially if you're like randall here and you have enterprise linux uh i think fedora is probably the distro for you i'll be honest i'm looking forward to, to our open SUSE review because i, I have a soft spot for open SUSE. Mm. but uh, i'd say fedora 16 is is if you are if you are a Fedora user, Fedora 16 is a great upgrade. It is, and you make yeah. sure to use pre-upgrade. <laughs> use uh, like the man says, use pre-upgrade. All right, everyone, and, uh, remember stick around in the chat room because I'll I'll put the torrent link in there in just a minute. Yeah, we'll have we'll have the torrent so people that watch us live can get on that, and that helps the people then later who download it later on. Then they already have a little bit of seed, so it's a win-win. So thanks to the chat room for doing that. Okay, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Fedora 16. That brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Alan, thanks for joining me once again. No problem. Good show. Now, uh, we should remind people that uh, they can go over to the show notes and get links to anything we talked about. Just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and find season 19, episode 5. Also, reminder, next week, it's the uh, OpenSUSE 12.1 review. So uh, tune in to uh, see our thoughts on OpenSUSE 12.1. And also, just a friendly reminder about that uh, newsletter we're launching. You can find the link to that, or actually just the sign-up bar, in the mm -hmm. show notes, or go to bit.ly slash JupyterSignal. Mm -hmm. um, Alan, was there... Uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to say thanks to Alan. Thanks to our very own Alan for providing the bandwidth uh, for, uh, over at ScaleEngine.com for the live stream today. It worked yeah. great, man. We, had an, we rocked the stream. The I played the entire thing in VLC and recorded a local file right here the entire time. Yep, and we had uh, good traffic, too. We saw... Uh about double the traffic just on the U.S. server uh, than stoked even. So Nice. Well, way to go, Linux Action Show audience. And uh, mm -hmm. also, don't forget, you can find the uh, Fedora Virtual Box download in the uh, show notes as well. Now, yeah, and uh, I'll paste that in the chat room in just a couple minutes. Now, uh, if you want to get a hold of Alan and I after the show, you can do that over at Twitter. Alan is twitter.com slash Alan Jude, and mm -hmm. I am twitter.com slash Chris LAS. That LAS part right there, that stands for Linux Action Show. You see how mm -hmm. I did that? And uh, we're also both on Google+, Plus, which is rocking these days, so you can find yes. links to that in the show notes. Oh, also, uh, if you're a Google+, Plus user, I started a Jupyter Broadcasting Google+, Plus page. Da, 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 da. It's such yeah, a you should uh, add a link to that in the uh, you're right. show notes. I intended to do that. I will do that. So if you want to follow the network, I'm going to be transitioning all of the announcements about show releases and live stuff over to the Jupyter Broadcasting page and use my page for whatever the crap I feel like. So that'll probably be something you want to go join if you want to follow us there. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>